Um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about generalization and double defense. Um, if at any point you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt. Um, uh, so I can clarify. Okay. Um, just to set things up, uh, I want to quickly go over what supervised learning is, or in particular, this empirical risk minimization, uh, just to make sure we're on the same page. Uh, so suppose we have some function f that maps from like x to y. Uh, it's potentially stochastic, and you want to learn this function. All right, and in the empirical risk minimization framework, uh, ERF, we have x as a sort of two things. Uh, the first is a bunch of input-output pairs, x1, y1, all the way to x and yn, then sample from some distribution d. Uh, and you have a parameterized family of functions f, uh, parameterized by these parameters theta. Right? And the goal of empirical risk minimization is you want to find the family f empirical inside our family that minimizes this uh, empirical. Right? So you Evaluate it on the, all the x's, look at the difference from the y's, and sum them up to take the average. So, for classical optimization, the objective is just to solve this. And to understand the generalization error, right? The generalization error is when you're given a new point that was not in your training data, how well does your function do? Um, we would normally look at this quantity, right? So, for example, x and y from your distribution, you care about the expected difference. Is it square for convenience? Uh, square is for convenience. Um, I don't like square. <laughs> okay, and classically the idea was that if you n is big, right, if you have a lot of training samples, uh, then this sort of population estimate is a good estimate for the expectation. Right? And so the idea was if you have a large number of training samples, you have a good idea for the generalization. And so the goal then was to figure out what the correct family F is for us to work with. Okay. Um, and so that leads to something called the bias variance trade off. Uh, so we call that we solve this problem to get our F empirical. Um, and we're going to let F bar be the expected learned function. Right? So remember, our data is random, right? It was drawn IID from some distribution. Uh, so if you take the expectation over that randomness, you get an expected learned function. Right? And so now you have an expected learned, so you have randomness over the functions you learn. So you can talk about a bias, you can talk about a variance. Uh, and so in particular, you can decompose those generalization error into two terms. Uh, the first one is the variance, and the second one is the bias. Um, so let's look at these two terms a little bit more closely. Um, so remember, right, we're imagining we have large n, right? So we have a lot of data points. So our training error is supposed to be a good estimate of this. And we're trying to figure out what happens to these quantities as we make our family of functions more or less complex. Right? So if we look at the first one, right, variance, if we increase the complexity of the functions that we can learn, uh, we expect that our expected learned function and the one we currently learned might get further apart. Right? So that we have more functions that we could potentially pick from, the distance could increase. And so, classically, the idea was as our family becomes more complex, uh, the variance increases. Right. On the other hand, uh, the bias is looking at the difference between our expected learned function and the true function that we want to uh, model. And as we should expect, as our family gets more complex, uh, potentially we somehow get the true function into it. And so, as f becomes more complex, we expect the bias to. Right? So as we increase complexity, we have the variance increasing and the bias decreasing. Right? So you have this sort of, uh, um, they're going opposite ways, so you have to balance them out. Right? So you expect the bias to be decreasing, variance to be increasing, and if you want to minimize <coughs> your generalization error, you want to pick somewhere in between. Right? And so that was the idea, you want to do balance between the two. Um, and this is done normally by limiting the complexity of the family. All right. Um, and in many cases, classically, this was limited enough so that our training error was bigger than zero. All right. Um, all right. 
So let's see a concrete example of what happens if we try to train all of these models. Uh, so here I'm going to take 20 data points, sample uniformly between negative 1 and 1, and I'm going to let f of x be the sort of cosine function. And so you have the function there, and you can see the points. Sample. Um, and what I'm going to use is this sort of family of functions here, uh, where phi i are some basis vectors, uh, beta gives you your coefficients, and so it's a linear space of functions, and the complexity will be governed by varying the dimension of the space. Right. Uh, so in particular, the basis function I'm going to use are the Legendre polynomials. Right? I'm going to try to do polynomial interpolation. Um, and let's just think about what we just learned, what we should expect should happen. Right? So initially, when we have k small, right, so we have low degree polynomials, right, we should expect a bad set, right? A constant or a linear function should not be able to approximate the sign. As we increase the degree, right, we expect the fit to get better. But then our bias variance trade off says as we keep increasing the degree, we expect our fit to get worse. Our fit meaning on the whole point, on the whole side. Right. Okay, right. So as k increases, we get some local optimum. Um, and once we get k equals 19, right, since we have 20 data points, we can exactly fit our data. Uh, one polynomial that goes through it. And we expect that to actually be a pretty bad one. Okay. <clears throat> and so at this point, we have zero training error. And so like I said, classically, we would stop here because we think the training error is a good estimate of the generalization error. Um, and we don't consider k and bigger. Okay, so let's try it out. Here is a degree zero polynomial, it's a very bad fit. Um, if we go up, degree one, still quite bad. Degree five, it's getting a little better. Uh, degree six, this is better. Uh, degree seven, you can see it's starting to get a little worse. Pay give attention to the sort of axis over here, it's on a log scale and it'll change. Right, by the time we get to 14, this is quite bad, right? This is like negative 10 to the 3, this is 10 to the 1. We keep going, it gets even worse. At 19, right, we exactly go through all our data points, but our fit of the general function is quite bad. Right, so like I said, classically, we would stop here and be like, well, 7 looks good, right? We'll go back to 7. Okay, but we no longer do classical computation. So we continue. So 20, it actually got better, right, if you paid attention to the axes. Uh, if you actually go up to 25, it gets very good. Um, if you go up further, 26, it gets even better. Uh, 27, I think this was the best one I found. Okay. And now if you continue from here, it actually starts getting worse again. Okay. Um, so what did we see, right? So we plot somehow this uh, L2 difference, L2 norm between our learned function and the sine curve uh, versus the degree of the polynomial, and you'll see this sort of double descent. Right? So this is the first descent, that's the second descent. Right? So the error goes down, then it goes up, and it comes back down. Uh, so what happened here, right? So the error peaked exactly at the point where the training error became zero. Right? So if you look at the peak of this error, it's exactly at 19. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Okay. Just a quick question. I wonder how do you train the model. So, when you say that when the degree is smaller than 20, are you just using the analytical solution to get the estimated? Um, you know, I'm just solving the least squares problem, and I take the minimum one solution. Okay, so are you using gradient descent? To no, I, like we just write down the pseudo inverse, right? Oh, yeah. That's a great question. Um, Right, and so this peak happens at this interpolation point. And the issue was the assumption that the variance is monotonically increasing. Right, so what actually happens from our previous double descent curve is the bias continues to go down, the variance goes up, it peaks at this point, and then it comes back down. Okay, um, and so this variance is related to this uh, notion of inductive bias, which is related to the norm. Right? So remember beta was our vector of coefficients. Um, and so if we plot the degree of the polynomial versus this norm, uh, you'll see that this norm increases and also peaks at that 19 and then comes back down. 
So if we think about it, uh, when k is equal to 19, right, we have one polynomial that exactly fits our data. Um, but as we increase k, right, we have multiple solutions that fit our data. And because we're picking the minimum norm solution, right, that's what causes this norm to come. Um, that's also what causes the variance of the model to decrease. Right, so this is sort of the modern regime. Right, once we have hit the interpolation point, uh, we no longer have a unique minimizer. Uh, we extend many minimizers, and we see this sort of double. <laughs> yeah. So in your picture, it's interesting. So how do we sort of build the sense? Is as you get really large, the kind of the risk goes down to zero, but you're showing the double. Do you kind of go up again as you get larger again? Yeah. So, so I think so did that. Yeah. Is there? Is, is, is this? Would there be a triple descent here, or is there? What's the um, there could potentially be another descent. Um, I don't know. I started running into numerical errors after this, right? Okay. Because degree sixty polynomials are quite okay. big. <laughs> um, is there anything special about the Jean polynomials in this regard? Like um, the yes. polynomial regression, where you get similar things. So, so if you try it with a standard basis, so like uh, one x x squared x cubed, I actually did not see that. Wow. So the Basis actually matter. Do you use always uh, the polynomials or maybe a rational function also? Um, so in this example, it was just polynomials. But you can see this for any most sort of regression. If you use rational functions, other sort of kernels or bases, it doesn't seem to matter. Um, except for this one. Yeah. Okay, this is very analogous question. Uh, <laughs> so, the, so the basis then, if the, choosing the basis seems very important for doing the problem. Mm -hmm. What do you see for your question? Is there any, uh, is there, do you have any insight into like which basis, yeah, which choice of basis leads to the double descent? Which one tells you things really? Um, so in this case, the Lajarka basis is like a cosmos. The standard basis is not, as Guido pointed out. Um, but I don't know if that's what plays the role here or not, but. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. All right. Um, so the modern regime this sort of leads to a lot of many interesting questions. It's like when does this occur? Right? Where is the peak when it occurs? Uh, what happens to the right of the peak as you were just asking? Right? Like do you think it goes down? In this case, actually went down and went up. Uh, where is the minimum error? Right? So for our previous example, I think it was at uh, degree 27. And then how do we mitigate? Right? We don't want the severe <coughs> Thank you. Okay, um, so normally I would then go into sort of trying to answer some of those questions, uh, but today I want to try to show you how you can prove that double descent occurs in like uh, some specific simple scenario. I give a sort of math tutorial or some of the techniques that go into this. Um, okay, and so for that we're going to look at a simplified setting uh, where we're going to do our proofs. So imagine we have two clusters of data points, right? You have plus ones in red, you have the negative ones in blue. Uh, they both come from the Gaussians with mean mu for the plus one, mean negative mu for the negative ones. Uh, and you just have labels one and negative one. And you want to learn a linear classifier. Uh, and you predict the sign by just doing W transpose your point, and then you predict the sign. <coughs> so positive, you say plus one, negative, so negative. Okay. Right. And so our empirical risk minimization would say, well, we want to minimize W that minimizes this loss. Right? And we can write this in sort of a matrix format. Right? So we can let Y be this vector of all the labels. We can let X be the matrix of all the data points. Um, and then we can have W star be the image. So in the picture, I do it in two dimensions. Uh, but just if you notice, I've written this in D dimensions. Okay. So the question is about how do you solve this, as was asked before. So in this case, we're going to consider maybe gradient descent. Right, so gradient descent is a fact algorithm where you take the derivative of your loss with respect to your parameters. Uh, you have some learning rate alpha, and you update your current parameter by alpha times the gradient. And so the idea is you start off at some point, and uh, you keep doing these steps, you walk down. Okay, 
so for us, we had our loss function, and so we can compute the derivative with respect to W transpose. Right, so when you compute the derivative, you have a negative from the negative over here. Uh, you have the two comes down to the square, and then you do J rule to get an X transpose on the other side. Right. Um, and so using that, we can rewrite our update step in front of this one. Any questions? Yeah. All right. Um, so here's the first uh, sort of result. Uh, is if you run grade, if you start the gradient descent at w zero, uh, and you run t steps of gradient descent, uh, after t steps you can write down a nice expression for what your update product is, uh, given by this sort of thing. Um, and the proof of not really going to it is quite simple if you just use induction uh, to see this. Basically, if you go back to this expression, uh, you can group this w with this w to get i minus xx transpose. Um, and then if you keep unrolling the induction, you'll see you'll get powers of this and powers of this. Okay. Uh, so the question is, well, when we run gradient descent, we want to run it for like sort of infinitely many steps. And so what happens as t goes to infinity? All right, um, so this depends on alpha, right? This depends on our learning rate. Um, so if we have that alpha is less than n over the maximum eigenvalue of xx transpose, uh, then we have that if we look at the eigenvalues of this matrix, i minus two alpha over n xx transpose, they have magnitude less than one, right? And if they have magnitude less than one, we see that if we raise it to the tth power, right, the eigenvalue becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And as you said, t to infinity, this can reduce this thing. Okay. Um, we can then look at the second term over here. Uh, the second term might look a little complicated, but if you squint at it and pretend everything is numbers rather than matrices, uh, it becomes nicer. Right? It becomes a geometric series. Right? You have some constant in front. You have something that has magnitude less than one that you're raising to powers. Um, and so similar to the standard geometric series for numbers, you have a formula for the answer for this one. And you can just write it out, it comes out to this. All right, so if you sum it up, you see that the answer is just x, y, a pseudo inverse. Okay. Um, interestingly, if alpha is bigger than this, uh, then you can use sort of similar arguments to see that the norm just as an exercise, right, this leaves out one case that's alpha equal to this. Uh, it might be interesting to write down what happens in that case. Okay, um, so now we care about generalization, right? So we've trained our classifier. We care about how well it does on sort of a new data point, right? So we give it a new data point. We care about how well it does. And so there are two metrics over here, right? So we trained our network using this mean squared error, but actually because we're doing classification, the thing we care about is accuracy, right? How well does it predict the correct sign, plus or minus one? Okay. Um, so I'm going to try to simplify some of the expressions first so we can do some of these calculations. Uh, right? So we call that we have xi from the Gaussian, this is negative Gaussian. And I can rewrite that in sort of matrix format, right? So if x is my data, it has this matrix D that we call. It has the mu, so the plus or minus mu, depending on the data point. And then A is the matrix which has entries from standard Gaussian. Right? So then this matches up with what we had over there. Right? I can remove the means, and in both cases they shift to standard Gaussian. And then you can get your sign labels also from new transpose. Right, so mu times mu would give you plus one. Right? Let's assume mu is one one, and mu times negative mu would give you the negative. Okay, so we can write our data as a z plus a, and we can write our label as a mu transpose. Right, so if we go back to our expression, uh, this tells us that the optimal thing is given by mu transpose z z plus a pseudo. Okay, um, so the first thing we want to do to be able to understand this is actually expand the pseudo inverse. Uh, so we can simplify some of the expressions. 
Uh, and this is where this nice theorem by Meyer from 1973 comes into play. Um, and what it basically says is if you have a full rank matrix A uh, and you have any vectors, U in RP and V in RQ, um, then you can write, expand this uh, pseudo inverse into some simpler, it might look more complicated, but believe me, simpler. Um, right, and so this fits into what we have over here because the Z of a rank one matrix, right? If we look at it before, right, all the columns are mu with plus or minus sign. So we can write it as mu times this time vector which has the signs. Okay, um, and I'm just highlighting some of these. There's a lot of constants over here, uh, but I'm just highlighting some of them. Uh, the rest of them, as you will see, actually don't play too much of a role. Question. Okay. So far, there's some linear algebra. All right. Um, and so then the result, actually, from one of my papers is so you can split it up into these two cases, right? Uh, if you look at this result, it depends on whether P is smaller than Q, right? So A is a P by Q matrix, and whether P is bigger than Q. You have know, these two different results. Um, so for us, we have P and N. So again, you can split it up into those two cases, and you get this is your expression for sort of W star. Um, I'm not going to go into the proof. The proof is just you write down those expressions, and so it's just mostly linear algebra. Um, okay. So let's see what happens when we evaluate it on a new data point. And let's imagine it came from the first cluster. Right, so it came as so it's mu plus a Gaussian. Uh, and let's do the case where g is smaller than. Right, so we care about, I'm going to call the whole data point x. Uh, so we care about what happens when we do mu star, uh, mu transpose times x. So we multiply, we have two terms. And I'm going to start by looking at the first one, hx. And when, so H is a random, uh, it's a random variable, right? It's a V transpose A pseudo, where A was this Gaussian matrix, right? So it's a random variable. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show that this random variable actually concentrates, right? So once we have concentration, we can just replace the random variable by the thing it concentrates to to simplify life. Okay. Uh, so to show concentration, I'm going to compute first compute the singular value decomposition of our random matrix A. So I can write that as u sigma v t, right? so left singular vectors, singular value, right singular vectors. And you remember A was a Gaussian matrix, right? So from isotropic Gaussian. So if you rotate an isotropic Gaussian, it stays isotropic Gaussian. You can rotate this to the right or from the left; it doesn't really matter. Um, and so what that tells you is that the U is actually uniformly, uh, it's a uniformly random or top matrix, right? Because rotating it didn't change the distribution. Uh, same thing for V. And because you can rotate them independently and not change the distribution, uh, the U, Sigma, and V are sort of jointly. Um, this is actually a very key property of uh, Gaussians that actually showed up in these groups a lot. Um, if you do more probabilities, this actually tells you that these matrices are free um, and free, needing free independent treatments to do our results. Okay, um, so let's see, let's take the expectation away, right? We want to show it concentrates uh, and see what it concentrates to, right? So H was V transpose A pseudo. Uh, we multiply by X, so we have V transpose A pseudo. Uh, I replace the A pseudo using the SVD, right? So I get the V sigma pseudo U transpose. Um, and then because they're jointly independent, I can break the expectation of the product into the product of the expectations. Um, and now this is where our next property comes in, right? Where V is uniformly orthogonal and U is a uniformly orthogonal, right? So if we look at V transpose V, we get some C, which is uniformly random on the sphere. And similarly, u transpose x will be uniformly random on the sphere, right? And so then if we compute the expected value of an entry of a vector that's uniformly random on the sphere, by symmetry we get zero, right? Because it could be here, or well, we could negate it. So by symmetry we get zero, 
and till zero times zero, and well, we don't even care what the expected value is. We get zero. Okay, so we can show, so we want to show that concentrates to zero. Um, so while we show concentration, we need to show that the variance is small, and the variance decays. Uh, so in particular, uh, we can we want to compute the expected value of the square, right, for the variance. We, have, we know that the mean is zero, so we just care about this. Um, if you write it out, you'll have some cross terms. Uh, but the cross terms, again, using the sort of symmetry argument, will have expectation zero. So we can get rid of those. Um, and then we're just left with this. All right, so where did these things come from? Uh, so V was a uniformly random vector on, on a sphere of uh, magnitude 1. So that gave us a 1 over D. Uh, this thing was a uniformly random vector on magnitude x squared. And it's in dimension n, so you get an x squared over n. All right, and then we have the expectation of 1 over the singular value. Okay. Um, so here we need to do a little bit more work. I uh, need to start using some random matrix theory. Um, so the first thing in random matrix theory that I want to introduce is this no distribution called the Marchenko festival. You should think about it as a Gaussian distribution for matrices, because uh, you have a lot of nice universality results. So imagine you have some p by q matrix, like any p by q matrix, uh, with the entries having mean zero variance one, right, or standard standardization. And just to make life easy, we assume that the fourth moment is bounded. Right, so it's a nice distribution. And we look at this sort of gram matrix, which is mm transpose divided by 1 over q. Uh, and we look at the eigenvalues of this matrix. Right? So m is p by q, so mm transpose is p by p, so p eigenvalues. Um, and given that, I can write down this uh, Dirac delta measure uh, for the eigenvalues. Uh, so one thing to be careful, right, the randomness over here, right, this is a uniform distribution on those p points, right, the randomness over there, depending on which p of, which of the p points you're at, not the randomness on the entry of that, right, and I'm going to let c be, I'm going to think about this as p and q become very large, and I care about them becoming large, sort of proportionally, so I care about c being the limit of, of p over q as p and q over there. All right, so the point is we have some random matrix and we want to understand what its spectrum or eigenvalue distribution looks like. And what the Marchenko Pastor says, it doesn't actually matter what the distribution of the entries of M are. Uh, there are some measure mu c such that this empirical measure that I wrote down converges weakly to mu c. Uh, and you can write down the density of mu c in terms of this form. Right, so this sort of a universality result for the spectrum of random matrices, right? So for general universality with the central limit theorem, right? If we take sums of random variables, we get Gaussians. Here it says, well, if we take this really large random matrix, we somehow end up with this one deterministic uh, eigenvalue distribution. Okay. Any questions on that long? No. Right. Uh, so just to make sure everyone's familiar with weak convergence, weak convergence means if I take any continuous bounded function, then the expectation of that function with respect to my old measure converges to the expectation with new limit. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to use that sort of over here. Um, and so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to rewrite this in terms of the singular values or eigenvalues of, this, of a matrix that looked like what I had before. All right, so just doing a little bit of linear algebra, uh, you can rewrite this in this format. And now this looks like what I had before. Right? It's an AA transpose divided by one of the sides, and I'm looking at the singular value or the eigenvalue of this matrix. All right, so then I can use my weak convergence to say I can replace this um, again just doing some math. Right? So this becomes the expectation. So this thing weakly then converges to the expectation for the Marchenko Pastor. Uh, but then that expectation is just some finite number. I actually don't care what it is. And you see that this, so x squared probably grows like n. 
Um, and so we have an extra 1 over n, so we see the variance decays by 1 over n. Right? So what did we see? We saw that the expected value was 0, and that the variance is 1 over n. Right? So this means it's concentrating very quickly into 0 as we increase n. Okay. Um, so let's recall our expression here. Right? So we had this beta, tau, hx, these other constants, and one other quadratic curve. Um, so all of them are, all of these things are random variables. Uh, and so basically the idea is to show that all of these things concentrate to deterministic numbers. And then once you have what they concentrate to, you multiply it out and you get enough. Okay. Right, so let's try it out here. So specifically, if you look at my paper, we can show that beta concentrates to one. Uh, you can show that tau one concentrates to one over c. C is this ratio between d and n. Uh, the norm of e squared concentrates to one minus e squared. The n should be there. Um, and then, right, so then if you look at that first term, right, the beta becomes a one, the tau one is a number, the hx is zero, so that's where it goes away. Uh, if you look at the second term, uh, the e squared is a one minus c. On the bottom, you have one plus c, so this is a constant. And so then we just care about this like, quadratic term. Um, so for this quadratic curve, we can do a little bit more math. Uh, right, so we can take our random vector a, right? So our point was mu plus a, where a came from a Gaussian distribution. And I can split it up into two parts. Right? I can split it up into the part along the direction of mu, and I can split it up the, the part perpendicular to mu. And let theta 1, theta 2 be the coefficients. And so then I can rewrite this quadratic form in sort of this format, right, where it's mu and mu transpose. And then over here, where it's mu transpose and something perpendicular to mu. Right, so if you had to guess, well, you would expect the first term to give you something, right, because you're taking a quadratic form. And you would expect the second one to be sort of zero, right, because it's mu with something perpendicular to mu, even though this is a matrix in the beginning. Um, and that's actually something you can show. Uh, so this is from a different paper. Uh, the second one concentrates to zero. Uh, it basically follows from symmetry. You can use a symmetry argument. Um, and the first one, using a similar argument to what we did before, right? you write A in terms of the SVD, multiply it out, you get something with the uh, eigenvalues, and you, you can show that the first one concentrates to this number over here. Right? So it's a one plus theta one, right? which is a nice thing. And then the c over c minus one in c in a second sort of goes away. All right, so if we write down our sort of final result, All right, if we do it with a plus mu, you'll get a plus one. If you do it with a minus mu, you'll get a minus one. And then you have some constant. So if you look at the sign of this, it gives you the correct sign. Right? All right, so we started at a plus mu, you, start, you, you ended up with a one. Sorry, with a negative mu, you ended up with a negative. Um, and you can do a similar argument for when d is bigger than n to get something like this. Okay, so this means if you take the sign, you have the correct sign on your generalization point. And so you have the correct, you have 100 percent accuracy for this model. Well, technical, but C could be D one. Um so C could be one, but we sort of that case doesn't fall under this uh, proof technique. So you can do for all c smaller than 1 and all c bigger than 1. The c equal to 1 case, you need to do some other uh, things. Because you have some convergence issues um, and things like that. But it works out OK. Because like, if you look at these two, if c goes to 1, that constant goes to a half. And you get a half over here. So you imagine it's OK. Yeah. But to that point, it, it really seems to be sensitive to like the width or the tallest of the matrix, where it's like the dimensionality versus the number of data points. Mm -hmm. It's like what determines everything. Um, yes, so the C is the dimension, this ratio. Yeah. Uh, and it'll matter for mean square, but, but since we only care about the sign for the accuracy, it somehow seems to not play a role. Because for any C, the sign is mostly the 
determined by this plus minus one. Sorry. Other questions? No. As I might have gone through that pretty quickly, I was hoping there were more questions with the map. But basically, that sort of going to give an idea of how you can use random matrices to prove some of these like, results. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, when we're looking at bill percent, this kind of problem analysis assumes you're changing both, the, like, it's both the dimensions of the matrix scale in some way together. Mm -hmm. but, like, a more classical one is when you would, like, I don't know, fix one and mm -hmm. the other. Can you still uh, derive double percent style arguments and analyses in this thing, or is it quite unique to this kind of? Um, I think it's quite unique to the proportional because, like, if you go back to uh, the very beginning, right? So, if you look at our empirical versus our expectation, right? So, if we fix the dimension, we send the number point to infinity, we do know that this empirical loss will converge to expected loss, right? So if you're somehow on the infinite number amount of data and fixed dimension machine, you should not see any double descent. As you see, it's pretty monotonic. Um, in the infinite dimension versus fixed number of data points, it's unclear, but I think it still should be. Yeah, I understand intuitively that there's the idea of like, oh, my input dimension might be fixed, mm -hmm. and I'm growing my number of parameters somehow, or some of these crossing parameters, and that's where I want to see the double descent. And it seems like with the random matrix style analysis, mm -hmm. that you've both got the same time. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, has anyone done the analysis that shows all the same if it seems the D, as it were? Or is that not written? Maybe it's done. Um, if you're fixing the D and you look just sort of like a finite range of N, yeah. then you can still show double descent because, like, every you could imagine you're in the proportional regime mm -hmm. and the C is changing because these things concentrate very quickly. Right? right? And so these. Uh, formulas tend to hold even if you like say fix D and say a thousand and you just vary D from say I don't know a hundred to ten thousand. Right? You you can approximate it by these stuff. And you can write down an error term which tends to be pretty small. Like with, I, I didn't do it here, but like you can write down how quickly everything concentrates, how quickly everything converges, and it be very explicit about. Yeah. For like a uh, for a linear classifier mm -hmm. in the um, over parameterized setting, mm -hmm. when say you correctly classified everything, mm -hmm. what corresponds to the minimum norm choice? Is it like the largest margin? Do they have some sort of like convergence support vector? Because um, isn't that the idea? Right? Like we're, I said, right now we're just picking the minimum norm among all of these many essentially. Yeah, so I'm not quite sure if the min norm one corresponds to the max margin. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a paper that looks at this uh, that looks like called classification works of regression. Um, but uh, I imagine they would be very similar to the little setting. Yeah. 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 So it seems like we're often dealing with the uh, mean square error, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where you need a lot of this like random matrix scale art style arguments and you want to see basic approximations and mm -hmm. get concentration. Yep. For other uh, uh, loss functions, do you see like a path to presenting the analysis? Do you have like, some kind of expansion of the <laughs> loss function and then you think of leading all the terms or something? Um, so in my head, the only reason the mean square loss is nice. Is because you can analytically write down what the solution is, mm -hmm. and like using pseudo inverse or matrix um, sort of things. If you can write down, so for example, for the max margin, you can also write down analytically, right, what the solution is. Or for other things, if you can write down a sort of matrix expression, you can always then use random matrices to sort of analyze that expression. Right? It doesn't have to be a quadratic form to analyze it. Mm -hmm. um, most likely, if it's not quadratic or an even power, it will like concentrate to zero. So if there are no more questions, thank you.